Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Hello everyone and welcome to Nerdy Optometrist, a podcast channel for all things optometry. And this is your host, Ukti Bora. Today I have not one, but two amazing guests for this special episode. One is definitely a known face and she's coming for the second time on this podcast channel. So she's definitely a nerd. But before we go to her, I'm so happy to have a new guest for this particular episode, Miss Sandra Stark. If I start reading her resume or bio, I'm telling you I'll need another episode. So just to make a little more concise of, you know, what education and what all she has achieved, I'm going to do a quick round of introduction. She's an optometrist who graduated in 1990. She did her bachelor's in honors in psychology in 98. She's the founder and CEO of Stark Griffin Dyslexia Academy. In 2015, she was the CEO and founder of Study Buddy, which is an assistive technology providing new and revolutionary software for South African learners. She's hosted from 2015 to 2019, the uh, SGDA conference on dyslexia in Cape Town and Johannesburg. She developed a new day for dyslexia memory game. In 2017, she did not author one, but three books, which, which were on topic of dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. She completed her master's in 2022. Her motto is, my devotion is to optometry, and my ultimate passion is dyslexia. I don't know how you have time to do all of this. I know I've missed a couple of things, but we're going to discuss it in the episode. So with that, a very warm welcome, Sandra, and it is amazing to learn so much about you. Thank you so much. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak on my passion. Awesome, awesome. And Mariki, my dear friend, I, I can definitely tell her that because we've been in touch for almost two years now, virtually, we'll meet soon. But to give Hopefully. her introduction as well, she has done amazing work. As we all know, she's an optometrist from South Africa. She's passionate about holistic vision health with a special interest in ocular surface disease and pathology, specialty contact lens and dry eye management. She's an author of Vision Trist Practical Guide to Anterior Segment Conditions book. She's a speaker at several national and international conferences online as well as offline. She's also a developer of GuruMed, an international learning platform that brings practical eye training for everyone. And I had a privilege to work on a course with her for that platform. And not to mention, there's another surprise element that we're going to be discussing that's coming up in this episode that she's added to her bag of all the accomplishments that she's doing so much. So with that, a very warm welcome, Mariki. It's a pleasure to have you back on Nerdy Optometrist. Thank you, Ukti. It's always fun and I'm looking forward to, yeah, to having some more fun together. So before we start the episode, I would like to do a huge shout out to two of the sponsors for this episode. Nano Dropper, which is first of its kind eye drop bottle adapter that reduces medication waste and saves eye care professionals and patients money. Nano Dropper easily twists uh, to most multi-use bottles, reducing the drop size by about 70% and creating the ideal size of drop for the eye to be absorbed. It makes it more sustainable as well as it makes it more affordable for everyone. So uh, with that, I would also like to thank Eye and Ear, our second sponsor, who are creating uh, a collaborative program for, of hearing solutions specially designed for eye care practitioners. As an eye doctor, you can now screen your patients, create awareness, and also treat them for mild to moderate hearing losses, just like giving out readers. This will significantly help you generate more revenue as well as help your patients in an entirely new way. A new vision in hearing care can begin with, and with that, let's get started. So uh, Sandra, I would like to start with you. I would want to jump into my favorite question is I want to go really, really back and understand how did your journey in optometry started? Was this an accident or was it something you had always aspired to do? Well, I guess the, the fact that I've been in practice since 1990, it's always bugged me. The fact that I see children in the optometric chair that really are smart. You understand that they, they do 
do well at school, they're supposed to do well at school, and yet they are failing subjects and they are failing grades. It always puzzled me that these children seem to have normal intelligence and sometimes even above normal intelligence, and yet they don't cope at school. And it was in 2008 when I actually did the Certificate of Advanced Studies in Pediatric and Binocular Vision, when we that was presented, sorry, by the Boston College of Optometry in Johannesburg, and we had international speakers. It was a wonderful course. But it was then that I realized that, you know, all the tests that are imported for our South African children to measure whether they have learning disabilities are all standardized for the UK market and for the United States. And that's when I decided to co-author and work together with late Professor John Griffin from the United States. And that's when we developed the Afrikaans and the English dyslexia assessment. And from there it just evolved and it's become my passion. Oh, so I also wanted to know like, okay, so this was your passion when you started taking your advanced course, but how did you enter into optometry? Was that planned or was it an accident? No, that was definitely not just an accident. Since I was in grade seven, um, I wanted to become an optometrist and I wanted to serve the community by making life better for them and there wasn't a better way for me than to make them see better because 80% of what you what you actually perceive is taken up through your visual system and if you can enhance that you can improve a person's life forever. So I, I believe you knew it at, at the seventh grade, you wanted to be an optometrist. I think even after being part of optometry, I was still confused of where should I move for ahead in this career and you knew it in seventh grade. <laughs> That's I never wonderful. doubted it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And also not just helping patients or uh, people see better, you're also helping with learning disability, which is another huge chunk of help that you're doing to the community. But before we get into that, Mariki, I know we have discussed this several times, even in the past episode, but who haven't heard that episode, can you tell us about your journey in optometry? How did you bump into optometry and, you know, everything that you're doing, doing right now? Yeah, mine was a little bit less, um, less glamorous, I think. Um, I bumped into it a little bit, um, a little bit more. I actually wanted to be a med student, so um, I've always had this passion. I wanted to go into emergency care. Um, a surgical case so and then um, unfortunately I just um, didn't have the grades to to make the cut so um, my folks said okay now well let's go and do something you know and you can always go back to medicine and so um, I applied for physio physiotherapy and optometry and I only got uh, accepted for optometry so that was kind of the default um, and then I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a, you know, I set my mind on something. So I said to my folks, no, 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 I'm going to finish it. And then once I finished it, then I'll go and I'll go do something else. And yeah, I never went and did anything else. I think um, I only really got into my fourth year when I decided this was this was for me. So um, I, I even even halfway through my fourth year, I almost dropped out. So, um, but I just kind of pushed through and yeah, I've, uh, yeah the passion has just grown over the years. I, I don't think I had it initially. But I was privileged, uh, you know, that God put me in a practice where I was able to, to have all of this different types of medical uh, situations. And it, it showed me a medical side of optometry that I didn't know mm -hmm. existed, which kind of just made me stick. So I'm, I'm glad that that's where I am and I'm not in emergency medicine care. You know, I think with children, that's just the worst place to be. Well, I have to say this is such a unique perspective because very few are like Sandra, you know, who would know what they want to do. Majority of the optometrists or people would be like us who didn't know where they were going and were trying to figure out. And then we just decided, okay, let's, let's start, let's do. And then we just never looked back and we enjoyed how destiny happened. So I'm glad that you're making me more relatable and not odd one out. <laughs> But, but yeah, I love I love how some people know what they want, like Sandra, and some people are like us, you know, like we don't know, but we'll figure it out on the go. <laughs> so Sandra, I, I actually, as I mentioned, right, I just took a glimpse of all the things that you started, because when you talk about, say, learning disability, there is, I don't know about how much is known in South Africa, but in general, you know, people are less aware, they don't want to even talk about it. 
So how did you first started looking into this, you know, the learning disability could be the space associated vision care and how do you want to kind of start? Uh, was it your professor who or the mentor who helped you or how did you start about, you know, digging deep into this space? Well, as um, part of our pediatrics course in varsity, we did a little bit on dyslexia and I give credit to my late professor Salvin Super, who actually um, yes, made me love pediatric optometry and also to John Carey, a very well-known optometrist that actually just touched base on the different types of dyslexia. And that actually started triggering my thoughts on, you know, let's just go deeper into this and investigate it. And that's when my journey really started. And I did a lot of research and I got hold of Professor John Griffin and that's, that's how it started. But I think what you mentioned is that people in South Africa society are very ignorant, unfortunately. And it's sad to say, but most teachers as well, they don't know what dyslexia is, like, let alone dyscalculia and dysgraphia. So it's it's a hard journey. It's it's really a very big responsibility to make South Africa and eventually the rest of the world aware of dyslexia and that it does exist. What saddens me even more is that professionals that are calling themselves educational psychologists deny the existence of dyslexia. And that is very concerning to our dyslexic community, which is which takes up 20% of the entire population, regardless of your age, your culture, your language, or your, your gender. It's, it's worldwide a, a problem that we need. It's not a problem. In fact, it's a gift, but we'll get to that later. But I think we need to address this on a global scale. Absolutely. And it is funny when, you know, I and Mariki were talking about what you do and, you know, doing this episode, I only knew about this, I would say in more detail. And I think when I say about me, it's also like, I think majority of India, there was a movie, a Bollywood movie called Tare Zameepe, which talks about this condition. And there's a brilliant kid who can, who is an artist, but he just can't understand letters. And his parents like, think that, you know, he's just being ignorant, he's being naughty, he doesn't want to study, and they put him in a hostel, and he just get, he just feels, like, so sad and depressed, and he cries, like, you know, he throws all the tantrums, and nobody can pick up that, you know, he has this problem, until, like, a professor picks it up, and then trains, and then he becomes an amazing student, and, you know, he excels, so that, is the way you know how I would say mass in India knew about this condition that does exist it wasn't the kid being naughty because he had a brother who was brilliant academically and they're like how could you not understand or how could you not read <laughs> till they you know pick up this condition I would also like to share that the movie like stars on earth uh, just mention the name again in Indian Tare which which exactly yes. translates into what you said Okay, Like Stars on Earth is a fantastic movie. Any hard person that doesn't have any emotions will cry in that movie. Absolutely. I, I practically watched it about eight, nine times and every time I cry and I use a lot of snippets from that movie in my presentations because it definitely um, validates the fact that these children need to be accommodated and they need to to find a diagnosis for them to excel eventually in school and to reach their full potential. It's the best, best move, movie ever. And it is on Netflix at the moment and we actually promote it. I would like to share with you when we um, actually founded RADAR, which is the Red Apple Dyslexia Association of South Africa. Um, it's a nonprofit organization we had a movie premiere and we, um, in Johannesburg, we, we rented a theater and we showed the movie. But when we, we had this movie premiere, we invited the director of inclusion education of the Department of Basic Education. And he attended, but he said to me that he will only stay for the pizzas, which we had, 
And then he had to go because unfortunately he had to prepare for a symposium in Cape Town the following week. And as we went into the theater and we um, had like lucky draws and special prizes for some of the members in the audience, um, he stayed and I didn't know that he, that he was still in the audience and we started watching the movie. After the movie, everybody went out. Nobody wanted to greet me because their eyes were red and they were all crying. Fortunately, we gave them some goodie bags with lots of tissues in it. And as I entered into the foyer, I saw but yes, Dr. Moses Similani standing still. And I said to him, I thought you'd gone home. You had to do some preparation. And he said to me, you know what, Sandra? When I started watching that movie, I couldn't stop. And I feel that every teacher in this country needs to see that movie. And that's the way I feel about everybody in the whole world needs to see that movie, like Stars on Earth, because little Ishan battled so much, having a little brother, a, a bigger brother that excelled in school, and he was the creative and daydreaming little boy. Um, and then his teacher absolutely lifted him up out of that black hole that he was, was confined to because of his dyslexia. It's the best movie and it's the message out there is every child is special. Absolutely. I, it is, I had no idea that, you know, this movie had so much impact uh, on, you know, in your entire effort. I, the minute I see this, Dyslexia, that's the only movie that I know or like, you know, how everybody started talking about this problem. So it definitely has a huge impact. And yes, I highly recommend everyone to watch it for sure. Another movie that is doing the rounds now on, on Netflix is Rescued by Ruby, mm -hmm. which is also a, a true life story of um, a dyslexic um, police officer in the United States. Please watch that movie as well. Awesome. All movie lovers, you all know which movie to watch next. <laughs> so see, <laughs> on Nerdy Optometrist, we don't only really talk about nerdy things, but we also talk about movies to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so now I know that, you know, learning disability, and as you had mentioned earlier, that 80% of the learning happens through vision. So vision definitely has a very crucial role in the learning disability as well. So uh, Varik, I would want to start with you. What, what according to you, or how much is the importance of vision correction in learning disabilities? Because you come from a very different perspective. So if you can share a few thoughts there. I think the main thing is that as optometrists, you know, we need to just not lose sight of the basics. You know, it's always important just to get the basics done. Um, and vision correction is, is still one of the leading causes of, of struggles. You know, there's still people going uncorrected. So the challenge, though, that I'm experiencing is that children at a young age are getting spectacle correction um, with the guys or with, the, with, with this thing about, oh, well, that's going to make you read better, um, which is not necessarily the case either. So um, for me in practice, it's about, OK, we've got to do our general um, consult. Um, and I need to just add here, I've got a very big challenge and problem with children going through a quick school screening process. You know, children and, and children vision care is not quick. It is not easy. <laughs> it's not supposed to be. You know, you can screen an adult, but screening a child is a, is a, is a useless point of exercise. I believe children need to have in a comprehensive exam in my pediatric exams or at least an hour just for my visual exam. And I'm just talking about basic visual care binocular vision um, pathology, you know, because it's very, very important that we need to make sure that the binocular system is functioning 100% and sort that out. And then from there, carry on with the, with the dyslexia assessments. So um, my pediatric kids always know, that I've got parents now and Sandra will probably have the same, they phone, they wanna have a dyslexia assessment. Then I actually have them in for their comprehensive first and I'll reschedule them. So I book them two days a separate, one for a comprehensive and one for, for a learning disability assessment because it's just too much. You know, kids can only handle that much um, attention at a time. So I would say, you know, for me, points is don't over, over prescribe for kids. If they need glasses, give it to them, but it's not always necessary. 
make sure the binocular vision system is accurately assessed, and then do your learning disability assessments because you've got nothing to lose. Um, and I've, I'm really sure Sandra will touch on this, but I believe every child should have at least a learning disability screening because you're not going to know unless you've actually asked the right questions and taken them through the process, you know. So it's just become part of the way I work. And we've picked up um, kids with problems that parents might not have, because parents are not going to come to you and say, oh, my child has a learning disability. Right. They, they say the teachers referred them because they're struggling at school. They probably can't see or the ADHD or they can't concentrate or they're naughty. You know, they don't come and say, oh, I think my child has got dyslexia. You know, so if we are not going to actually screen for these things, we are not going to be able to um, really support the kids effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a very good point, which you said that don't take away optometry out of sight when you're trying to focus on something else. It is still the primary uh, reason why people will come to you and then how you go to the next step. And Sandra, if you can touch as just to you know piggyback on what Mariki mentioned of how do you do the screening, if you can give us some idea or information about that. Yeah, I would just like to comment that I do agree with Mariki 100%. And um, what we've noticed lately is also that the children that go to school aren't ready for school. And unfortunately, the school readiness assessments that are done are also done like in 20 minutes. There's no way that you can assess whether a child of age six is ready to go to school um, in South Africa, age six. It's very important that a thorough examination is done and also, once again, very sad to say that the current assessments for school readiness available in our country doesn't even include a visual analysis or visual assessment. And that's why we brought in the Star Griffin Super School Readiness Assessment, which is at least two hours long. And you actually assess whether that child has got all the perceptual and foundational skills ready to commence with his school career. And I would just like to add on the dyslexia part, you know, us as optometrists, often people ask me, but you're an optometrist, besides the fact that I've got my psychology degree as well, but you're an optometrist. What does that have to do with dyslexia? It's got everything to do with dyslexia because your magnocellular visual pathway is affected. All your visual skills is affected. And once we throw in ADHD with medication that these children are on, their accommodation systems are also affected. So it's very important that a thorough visual examination is done on that child that is preschool to the child that's in, in um, primary school, middle school and elementary school and high school, very, very important. And our adults as well, our adults too. I didn't even know that this much of information uh, before talking to you. So thanks. This is such an like educating uh, episode for me myself. So when you talk about like you know doing this this thorough assessment and making sure that the kid is ready for the school, you also mentioned about adult, and I did see in you know the things that you had done. What are what can an adult do or learn? Like, you know, they have kind of tackled around it throughout their life. They kind of know the work around it. How do you do or how do you address this problem for adults? The fact that 80% of school leaving individuals are not diagnosed. These dyslexic individuals aren't diagnosed. It leaves, unfortunately, a window for them to be very unhappy in their working in environment. So in the workplace, it's very important to firstly identify the dyslexic in the company and then for that person to, to have a proper diagnosis done because obviously you will find yourself in situations where these people are appointed in administrative positions and that's the last place you need them to be. We have had several referrals from companies and even including mine where we find that the young apprentices are, are trained and they do exceptionally well in the practical element of the exams, and yet they can't write the exam. So those individuals need a thorough examination and a diagnosis done to actually afford them to do oral examinations, for example, for them to qualify in their trade that they, they are busy doing. 
So it's, it's very important for adults to be diagnosed and placed in the correct position because you can absolutely build your, your, your business by appointing the, the dyslexic adult in the right place. They have got unbelievable talents and they are an asset to your, your company because they are outside of the box thinkers and they see things we will never ever see being normal readers. I think this is a wonderful insight which you shared that in, irrespective of the age, it is important for everyone to get screened if they're struggling with anything which you might be able to get away say for a few years or maybe say 10, 15, 20 years of your life, but it's better to get help and like get treatment or you know find solutions versus feeling miserable. So whether it's a kid, whether it's a family member, whether it's someone in the office, uh, it is always better to kind of try and review or help them instead of seeing people feeling miserable. And one thing which you mentioned is, uh, is, is amazing that, okay, they might need a little help in doing one thing, maybe writing or, you know, with numbers, but they might be excellent in practical solutions or finding ways around it. So we need to see the strengths and not the weaknesses of, you know, any individual that, uh, that is out there. Another thing I'd like to add is that uh, just recently in the past two weeks, Richard Branson from Made by Dyslexia also introduced the uh, trait for on LinkedIn to mention that you are a dyslexic thinker. Mm. And that is an asset on your CV as well. Because um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the FBI of the UK, which is Scotland Yard, if they recruit for new personnel on their staff, they actually advertise for dyslexic people because they see things that we don't see. Their perception is totally different. And being an optometrist, I can use the analogy, the analogy of actually um, thinking of someone that is completely colorblind that sees in shades of, well, that sees only white, gray, and black. Right. That is right. an ideal person to send to war because they will see the camouflage in the field like no one else. And this is exactly the principle that dyslexics are recruited for because they see things and cues and clues that we don't see because they think different than we do. I think... I think this is wonderful that you mentioned and especially in an optometry reference of, you know, seeing how colorblind people can see colors in a very different way, but they can functionally do everything that you and I can do, right? So I think I think this is fantastic example for us to know and be aware of. Uh, so I think this is this is fantastic learning for me. But, you know, as you mentioned that there are, uh, there's lack of awareness there are struggles that are out there. So if you had to point out any major roadblocks in the learnings or, you know, through during your journey, I will start with Mariki because you have started incorporating the screening in your practice. So from a clinical standpoint, what has been your major roadblocks? I think the main thing is the fact that there's this incredible, um, I don't know how to call it, but there's this, ownership of dyslexia and dyslexia diagnosis and treatment um, in the medical space. And um, to a certain extent, I understand that. But as I feel in optometry, you know, optometry in terms of pathological care, we've had the same struggle, struggling to have a, a, a increased uh, scope of practice so that we can have better pathological skills and be able to prescribe. You know, dyslexia is the same. We, we, we're trying to break boundaries where there are more access points for these children to actually go to because we are limiting access points to specific individuals. And I know in my environment in South Africa, I think I know three or four or five educational psychologists in the whole country that can actually maybe do this, you know? And I'm sitting with a school of children of which probably 30% of those children are dyslexic and at least 80% of those are financially incapable of traveling, you know, so we're sitting with the same situation, you know, pathological care, we have this, this, this ground level group of patients that are not getting the medical care because 
uh, you know, the, the people who are in the right position are not allowed to be educated to actually manage them. And that's how I feel about dyslexia. I think, and that's what the, the Star Griffin um, Dyslexia Academy has been able to get right, is to train a wider range of professionals, you know, from the teacher to the OT, to the psychologist, to the optometrist, to be able to provide a wider level of access so that children can be seen, children can be helped. Because at the end of the day, that is the focus. The focus is on what can we do for these kids? You know, how can we make these kids' lives better and adults and whoever, you know, but to be able to have the care and the access there. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges, um, you know, that the, 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 the condition is facing in itself, you know. The rest is just from an individual perspective. I think as professionals and right across the board, we need to just walk into the space. We need to realize the need that's there, educate ourselves to be able to do this accurately and effectively, and just go for it. Because, I mean, in terms of schools, trust me, there is very little um, resistance at school level because a lot of the schools realize they're sitting with children that are struggling and they don't know what to do about these kids, you know? And the moment they have a professional walk in and say, okay, listen, I've got a solution, let me help you. They are very, very happy to have you walk into that space. You know, I mean, I've got all of my schools in my environment on board and they are, you know, I've gone and done talks and we'll probably do some more to get the teachers educated. So we are not getting resistance from schools and we are definitely not getting resistance from parents. Parents are so excited about this because at least there's some form of solution for them. So um, I think the biggest problem is at the professional level, uh, we need to just reshift the way we think so that we can, um, you know, just uh, get to these kids and as many as possible, as soon as possible. I think this is wonderful. And what you mentioned is, you know, to look at the bigger picture than, you know, fighting for smaller things. I think that's the bigger message. And it's, I feel, uh, I really appreciate what uh, Sandra has done with the academy, that we need people to kind of look into not just say whether it's yeah, dyslexia or whether it's vision care. We want screening or the access at ground level. It should not just be at the highest tier that, you know, everyone needs to go into that four walls of an office and be able to pay a certain fee only. Then you can start with any screening or diagnosis. Having a big human force because there is there is a shortage of staff anyways in healthcare overall so this is a very nice way of looking into at a bigger picture and you know training as many people as possible it could it could go from say screening through teachers and then you know the professionals can come in but i think that's a great point that you mentioned sandra would you like to add anything in terms of major roadblocks because you know you're doing so much <laughs> yes i would like to add um what mariki said is very important um, it has taken us 11 years to actually endorse and approve and list our assessments at the Health Professions Council of South Africa. And that not only includes our psychologists, but our optometrists, our occupational therapists, our audiologists and speech therapists. Why? Because you learn to read not only just through your eyes, but through your ears as well. Mm -hmm. And what is very important here is to note that dyslexia is a neurological condition and so is dyscalculia and dysgraphia. And as a professional, if you don't understand the physiology and the anatomy of the human brain working together with the rest of the body, you will not be able to understand how dyslexia works and how the dyslexic brain, dyscalculic and dysgraphic brain differ from the normal reader brain. It's very important. Ignorance needs to be eliminated. People need to be made aware that if your child is dyslexic, they aren't stupid. And that stigma needs to disappear and very soon as well. It's in fact, it's the above board thinkers and the absolutely critical thinkers and beyond what you and I can think, those are the people that are changing the world and they all are dyslexic. I loved how you are emphasizing enough on, you know, the importance of uh, it's, it might feel they're missing something, but what they can see and what they can think is beyond our capacity. So don't look at their, uh, I would say the so-called weaknesses, which is visible, but you have no idea about the strengths which are out there. And if they are catered well, 
they can change the world and i think i think that's fantastic message out here you know what other problem is for too long these individuals have been ignored they have been humiliated they have been embarrassed and they have been bullied for too long i can tell you horrific stories of children whose heads have been flushed in toilets who's been beaten with a wooden spoon over the head that have really had many of them consider committing suicide because of the depression uh, i just one comes to mind i think of robin williams the actor that committed suicide everybody said he was depressed but why was he depressed he also was dyslexic you know and we often forget the psychological impact this humiliation and um mistreating causes the dyslexic individual sorry i just get so passionate and and i just run away with it but i can't stop talking about this because we have to get the message out there this platform is all for it so i think what you are saying is really important because doing okay so you know you are diagnosing you are treating but also understanding the psyche it's it's also a very important part of it maybe you can't help anyone but the least you can do is make sure that you are mindful of these people you are making sure that they are not getting depressed maybe you are not able to provide them screening or help that might not be available around you but can you support them can you tell them something like this exist make sure you protect them in case if there is any bullying or if someone is feeling depressed i think all this is really important and uh, mental health and psychology is coming a lot is getting a lot of attention these days thanks to you know social media i would say which has brought a lot of attention uh, uh, to all these things that do exist which we have definitely ignored for years and it is good and i'm really happy that we are talking about it on this platform uh, now talking about technology which has been part of you know the every every space in healthcare and i am so excited to know that there is this huge collaboration happening with both of you and i would want you all to talk more about it and tell me how technology is going to change this space so who would want to talk more about it who would want to start <laughs> Marie, yeah, I think ahead. I think Sandra will have me speak about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, go ahead, Mariki. Tell us about this collaboration that's happening. Okay, so yeah, we very excited. So, um, uh, I became part of a company called uh, Vision WX or Vision uh, Wear Solutions RX. Uh, it's probably about eighteen months ago we started with this project. um and uh we were so excited to have Sandra and the SGVA collaborate with us so uh Vision Way X is a virtual reality solution in the learning disability space and what we plan on doing is delivering um all aspects of the um, dyslexia um screening and diagnosis and treatment but in a virtual reality system and we will be incorporating the SGVA program to be able to do that so The thing that makes this so amazing is that firstly it's going to be a time saver. Um the system itself is going to be um very user friendly and I think kids and especially this generation coming now is going to absolutely love it to be able to go into a virtual system and be um both be diagnosed and trained in that um virtual environment. And then the thing is is or the most important thing for me was access. You know, if we can actually have a system like this um we can put it in everywhere uh, from the school level all the way through to the professional level so um there is three tiers we're starting with the screening system which will be done at school level especially in the US the schools um do the uh, school readiness assessments and this is ho- we're hoping that we can incorporate this as um you know a baseline that has to be done on every child and it's one virtual reality system that gets placed in a school and the school can literally screen every single child that comes into that school for a uh, for a learning disability you know and then from there there'll be tiers into the the optometry and into the psychology space which will then be diagnostic and then hopefully um sometime next year we'll start working on the training or the therapy side and that i think i mean that's going to be epic because we're going to be gamifying it uh, we've got these new uh coin phrases uh, vrify and gamify i mean we've just <laughs> made the words now so i'm going to have them put in the dictionary so gamify dyslexia therapy i think is just going to change the world you know because for a parent myself 
I don't have the time to drive around after my kids and getting them everywhere. And these children really need, um, need the therapy um, as well. And then, so the, the, the parent can access the virtual system and they have a, um, a, a subscription to the software and they'll just be able to do their training from home, but it's monitored from the professional level. So yeah, we are exceptionally excited about this and we are so blessed uh, you know, that Sandra decided to, to join us and to be giving us her clinical and her professional um, input you know, and her program, to be able to use this program in the system. Um, I really think you know, we, we're gonna change the world. So I'm really excited about it. This is this is super exciting. Just for me to uh, understand a little more. So when when we are talking about you know VR, it is definitely very exciting. So will this software work on any VR set? Is it going to be a global initiative, or is it going to start with South Africa and then you know you're going to open up to the other countries? How is it going to be? So it's obviously going to be as wide as possible, but for now, and I'll bring it back a little bit, we are going into clinical trials um, towards uh, the latter end of this year, quarter four probably. Um, we are very much in the middle of development and uh, clinical trials will probably be mainly focused in South Africa just because me and Sandra are both here and it's just easier to manage it from here. Um, but we are planning uh, definitely to do some uh, trials in the US as well. So um, Vision Way X is a US based company um, and we have some contacts with some of the universities. So I work with SUNY um, and then um, the University of Michigan decided that they'll probably be involved as well. So we're going to have a few um, universities in the US side that's going to clinical trial at the same time as we will actually be doing it um, on this side. So by the early next year, we will have a working version of this uh, software that will be able to go to market. Um, so, um, but in terms of sales, we definitely want to go as big as possible. You know, this is not a country driven initiative. This is a worldwide solution. You know, this is something that every country needs as it progresses. Um, we'll definitely also um, look at different languages. Sandra's already been able to put this in different languages already. So this is going to be something that we'll do as we move into different countries, we'll probably be able to do that as well. But the, the point is as many places, as many people as quickly as possible. This is amazing. Sandra, this is such an exciting time for you, especially because you're doing something for 11 years and now it's getting gamified and you know, the virtual reality and technology coming in this space. Tell us more about your excitement and you know how do you see the future of this? dyslexia and the treatment and the screening? Well, I soon realized, Okti, that um, you have to shape up or ship out. <laughs> and technologically, I was very strained. And initially, when Mariki contacted me and I got involved with Vision Way, um, X and I met Jeff and the whole team, it was like, you know, it was just went over my head. I just didn't understand it. And it took a while for me to really grasp What's going on and yet when when the software developers start talking i still feel like i'm zoning out almost like ishan in like spas on earth um because i think i'm probably the oldest on the team myself and marius my, my partner so but my child is 18 years old and they understand this and they are even more excited about this and i was just realizing you know that kids today you have to think ahead Mm -hmm. of you know mm -hmm. what the world is going to evolve into what's the latest technology that they are involved in um we are still watching tv kids are on their phones all the time they're on their ipads and their tablets this is the route and the way that life is going and we better get in or otherwise we're going to stay behind but i'm very excited to have the proper diagnostic um component worked and implemented in this VR system. And it gives me great joy to, to um, confirm that um, I think we are going to change the world and the diagnostic um, way of, of treating dyslexic individuals. And I'm very happy to say that we believe that the clinical trials in the US will, will take off with a storm. I am super excited. Anytime there is technology and eye care, it is something that always catches my attention. And I, I, I love that space and how it's exploding. And adding dyslexia to it, I think is 
it's a fantastic because as you guys explain throughout the episode the importance and the lack of awareness and how much work needs to be done i think this is a fantastic way ahead thank you both of you for you know collaborating and working on this amazing idea i'm really looking forward to see where this is going what are the clinical trials i'm sure we're going to do more such episodes talking about how what is happening in this space so everyone do stay tuned and you know knowing because all the news will kind of start will be first published on nerdy optometrist so you have to keep following us to know what's new in this space of this entire collaboration with sgda and vision verex something i need to just add then is especially for the guys that's actually watching this is um uh, we need you guys to start getting trained. You know, we need you to start getting educated as teachers, as professionals. One of the prerequisites is that we have to do uh, the training course. You know, it's very important to have the knowledge to be able to diagnose effectively. And the SGDA has got incredible courses specifically based on that. So with Vision X system, one of the prerequisites would be to have your course um, qualification to be able to use the system. And this is available now. The courses are available on the Vision Way X website. Um, there's one for professionals and there's one for teachers as well. So if you guys really are interested in doing this, I would encourage you to go and do the course. Um, both courses are, well, the teachers one's a bit shorter, but the professional course is a six weeks course. So you want to get yourself trained and um, get yourself ready for when this drops. Um, you don't want to. You don't want to still have to do the training by the time you get your your VR headset because then you're gonna you're gonna you, you're gonna hate it because you're gonna have to still do the training. So, guys, go ahead, go visionwearex.com, and you really want to go and do the training as soon as possible so that we can be ready for when uh, the VRifying system hits the ground. Absolutely, and I'll be adding all the links of uh, you know Visionwearex as well as SGDA so you can get all the learning and training materials to know more about what we're talking in case if you have any questions you can always go back to their websites and learn more on it for sure so we did talk a lot about uh, dyslexia and, and we did learn a lot but nerdy optometrist does not end this episode without a game segment so when we're talking about gamification and gamifying let's go into a game segment which is a very simple and a fun game it is uh, it is called this or that so I'll be giving you two options. You have to choose what's your preference, just so that I know a little more of you know what kind of a person you are. So are you and are you both ready? Yes. Yep. All right. So we'll I'll always go with Sandra first and Mariki second. Okay. So Sandra, are you a dog person or a cat person? A dog person. Awesome. Mariki, you? Yeah, definitely dogs. Awesome. I'm scared of pets. <laughs> I, must, I must add, I don't have pets at all. But yes, if I had to choose, I'll go with the dog. <laughs> I, all right. Wonderful. Sandra, phone call or a text? Text. Text. All right. Mariki? Yeah, definitely. I'm bad. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sandra, a little more optometry. Glasses or contacts? Glasses. <laughs> okay, Mariki. Yeah, no, I'm. A, I'm just agreeing with Sandra. Yes, glasses. <laughs> oh my god, I need different answers. I feel I'm talking to one person. <laughs> okay, Mariki, I'm going to go with you first now. I just thought you'd know, be easier, but I'll go with you now so that you don't copy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> online shopping or shopping in store? Oh, online for sure. Sandra, for you. Shopping in store. I want to see uh, and feel yeah. it. <laughs> All right, wonderful. What is worst? Again, Mariki, I'll go with you. La laundry or dishes? Oh, both. Oh, uh, laundry, laundry. Now, laundry is worse. <laughs> okay, uh, Sandra. I agree with Mariki. They are, I would rather do the dishes. <laughs> And there's a dishwasher for that. There's no laundry washer that can actually iron your clothes. I mean, a dishwasher can do everything and even dry. You know, I mean, crazy. All right. Oceans or mountains? Say that again. Oceans or mountains? Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You've sort of, yeah, I don't know. Um, oceans. Okay. Sandra? I love both, but I would also go with oceans. 
Okay, perfect. And now I have to kind of again switch the turns. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sandra, horror movie or a comedy movie? Um, rather comedy. I hate horror movies. Oh, okay. <laughs> you? Comedy. No, me too. No, me too. I don't oh. sleep if I watch a horror movie. I'm just, I'm such a wuss. Okay, last one. What is most important in a partner? Mariki, I'll go with you. He need, uh, needs to be intelligent or funny. Ish. Intelligence doesn't mean anything without a sense of humor. I mean, you know, you, you, that's a very, that's a very diplomatic answer. You, you, you have, have to, to be both. You know? <laughs> oh, no, you have to be both. I, you can't be, you can't be funny without intelligence. You can't be intelligent without a sense of humor. So I would say both. <laughs> that's a very smart, that's a very smart answer. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, intelligence. <laughs> All right, fun. Yes. Awesome. With that, you all did fantastic in this game. Good job, both of you. Though I wish there were some contradicting answers, but I feel mm -hmm. like, okay, uh, you all agreed on many. So that's a fantastic thing to know about you. And before I let you both go, Sandra, if you could share a final takeaway message for all our listeners. Remember, a learning disability with no diagnosis is a diagnosis of no learning disability. So it's important to get that diagnosis for you to be accommodated and supported. And the other thing I want to say is there's always hope. Never give up. If you're a dyslexic adult or a dyslexic child, hold on to your faith and never give up hope. Awesome. Loved it. Uh, Mariki, a final takeaway message for all our listeners. I think it's important that um, we need to uh, stretch ourselves. You know, we're, we're in a, at a time where um, we cannot just do what we've done and the way we've done it, you know. So um, I think you guys need to get to a stage where you're comfortable stretching yourself. And um, we're saying this so much, but knowledge is power and gain the knowledge gain the experience, stretch yourself into spaces you haven't been. Um, and that's the only way we can really be great. Um, and yeah, that we can change lives. Awesome. So uh, thank you once again, both of you for both all your time and all the learnings. There was a lot that I learned today and I definitely will be dropping all the links of everything that we've discussed in the description. A huge shout out and thank you to both the sponsors, Ioneer and NanoDropper for supporting this episode. We really appreciate the support for, you know, making this uh, such an amazing episode for all of us. And, you know, do check out their websites and the links and make sure you take the course and you're ready for the next generation of, you know, VR solutions for dyslexia. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you.